Uh, thanks for joining me on this week's vlog. Another interview, I'm with Mike Brown. Well, first of all, Mike, thank you very much indeed for having me here. It's very kind of you to want to come here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, it's only a five-hour drive down overnight in a van and five-hour trip back. That's all. <laughs> this guy is committed. This is what <laughs> commitment looks like. Absolutely committed. Right, OK, so this is how the interview is going to pan out. I'm going to ask you some questions. Be honest or lie through your back teeth, it doesn't really matter. Then I want to ask you some, at the end of it, some fun, well, fun sort of, uh, quick-fire questions mm. to which I believe I already know the answers. So I've pre-written the answers down, all right? <laughs> so <laughs> We've got a little self-competition going on oh, here. We that have, yeah, fun. because I've been studying you a lot. So ah. I pretty much know all the answer to all these you questions. You were that bloke anyway. with the binoculars the other day, weren't you, in that bush? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, sorry about the way I dumped that bucket full of on you. Anyway. <laughs> right then, okay, so for those who don't know who you are, YouTube sensation... Professional photographer of how many years? Oh, crumbs. I wrote my first invoice in 1993. <gasps> so then, who is Mike Brown? Mm, that's a big question, isn't it? I'm a great big kid. I'll just sit back for 30 minutes. You sit back, yeah, and let him go. Yeah, by all means, stop me, because, <laughs> you know, zoom. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, wind him up and let him go. Who am I? Big kid. Uh, I'm a motorcyclist. I ride a motorcycle everywhere, rain or shine. I didn't today because... You know, okay, I got a, first, you know, Mike or the goatee? Uh, the goatee. I was yeah. born with it. My mother complained <laughs> bitterly as, 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 as... Anyway, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> who am I? Confirmed motorcyclist. I ride one, rain or shine. There's something about the feeling of freedom, about being part of the environment, being part of the world, rather than being closed off from it. And I think that's kind of part of the photography side of my things as well. Um... Who am I? Hey, that's such a difficult question. So, oh, it's probably easier to say, who am I? What do I do? What do I believe? All that sort of stuff. I'm in love with this world. I'm just in love with it. I just think we live in the most amazingly beautiful, incredible place. And in our societies, I think we live in the cushiest, most amazing places as well. You know, you start going overseas and you start looking at other societies and other cultures and think, you know, wow, you know, they haven't even got a fridge or a car or somewhere to sleep. Mm. I was in a room with some kids in uh, a little house in uh, Cambodia, I think it was. It might have been Vietnam. We worked with an aid organisation out there and try and put a bit of good back into the world. You know, and there's this kid standing there proudly in his football shirt. I think it was a Man United one. I'll dig the picture out and send it Surprisingly. To and might be. <laughs> but he stood so proudly in the front room with his hand on their flat screen TV. But if you look at the floor, it's this deep in mud and water. You know, yeah. it's like, <laughs> we don't know we're born. So who am I? I'm someone who really, really, I'm excited by seeing these things, about sharing those stories, about trying to take photographers to come and see and meet these people because they're usually gorgeous, wonderful, lovely people. Maybe give people a bit of a new experience, give them something they wouldn't see or experience in their normal day-to-day -day lives, get them to go home with a bunch of awesome pictures, having got some new skills and some stories to sell the folks back home. That is the travel tour. That's what lights my light. That's what buzzes me up. And the other bit, of course, is That's teaching. Like ticked off. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. The other bit is the teaching. Um, I love it. Those are the light bulb moments when a light bulb goes on for someone and they go, "Oh yeah, oh, I understand. I understand." A bloke called Luke came bouncing up to me on a workshop in. Switzerland on my in Zurich on my master class one day we were on a bridge it's called the vegetable cellar bridge and he just came around and goes no I've got it I've got it I go what Luke what he said how to make an interesting composition it's so easy isn't it and I'm like wow I played a little part in that and it's just the most rewarding thing on earth it is brilliant I love that okay so tell us about your um well I'm certainly studying you I realize that you're you, you very much are a glass half full man and not half empty. You're mm. a very, you have a very positive outlook in life. Um, that's what I feel. You're a very bubbly personality, so I can imagine coming on one of your, your workshops would be a, a bore as well, <laughs> I can imagine. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not just one of these you know, dry, miserable, right, you know, set your camera to manual, set your aperture to F11, you know, and just blah, blah, yeah. blah. You're not like that at all, I can imagine. No, no, not at all. It's like settings don't give you pictures. Mm. Pictures give you settings. It's like... You look at something, 
imagine, okay, how do I want this picture to look? And then you work back from there and go, okay, I want a shallow depth of field, therefore I need this sort of aperture and that sort of focal length. Sure. You know, do I want that pole coming out of, his, out of their shoulder? No, not really, so therefore I need to move down and left a bit. <clears throat> you know, what's the light doing? I've chosen that aperture for creative reasons, so now what shutter speed do I need? You work backwards, settings don't give you pictures, pictures give you settings. There's only about five things on a camera you need to know how to control. Most of it's their marketing purposes. There are some useful features, don't get me wrong. Don't write in, people. Yeah. But um, <laughs> there are some useful features there, absolutely. And there are some amazingly clever people. But a huge amount of these features are just confusing. We don't need them. Sure. They're not big, they're not funny, and they're not clever. Yeah. Think about Ansel Adams. Think about, you know, credited as being the greatest landscape photographer of all time. Cartier-Bresson. All the awesome photographers who were shooting, say, pre-mid-1980s, they never had electronics on their camera. No. They had an aperture, a shutter speed, and a focus ring. They took astonishing pictures and blew us away with them, and they're still doing it to this day. Absolutely. So why do we need all these whiz-bang features and crazy things in a camera? I'm going to steal one of your, your comments because you said it so passionately, and it's exactly the same as mine. So if anybody uh, watches my channel regularly, just switch off for 10 seconds because I'm, I want to regurgitate this at a future time and pretend it's mine. <laughs> somebody asked you a question about upgrading your camera mm. and it, it, it lit a fuse with you. You know, what you said was, I'm not interested in buying new cameras. New cameras don't interest me. What interests me is taking pictures. It's photography. Cameras I have no interest in whatsoever. Camera... There are some amazing cameras. Cameras are all fabulous these yeah. days. They are. All cameras take amazing pictures, don't care what brand it is. They all do a fabulous job. Um, but cameras don't take pictures. People take pictures. Um, upgrading the camera isn't going to give anyone a better picture. You know, whether you're using a phone. Uh, I, 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 know a si I, I knew a six-year-old boy who's now 17. Um, he took stunning pictures on his mum's phone just because somehow he instinctively understood light and composition and where to stand. But I've also watched a guy with a 50 grand Hasselblad take appalling pictures <laughs> because he doesn't know where to stand or when to click. Don't upgrade the camera, upgrade the photographer. Photography's a skill. It's like any skill. You that's, give... another, that's another one I have to use now. Don't upgrade the camera, upgrade the photographer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if, if you give me a Steinway Grand Piano, yeah. right, put me in the Albert Hall, yeah. okay, with a packed auditorium, I will not get a standing ovation because I'm playing a Steinway Grand Piano. I'll do a rather crappy rendition of Chopsticks. <laughs> okay? That's <laughs> you, so true, though. You, you give, you give um, oh, crumbs, uh, a pianist, someone, a concert pianist, you know, an old thing with a few of the strings broken and it's out of tune, the old thing you see in the corner of an old pub somewhere, they'll take everyone's attention away from whatever they're doing and have them spellbound. It's the same with a camera. C6 Steve. C6 yeah. Steve is one of my favorites. It's one of my like heroes. Two strings. Yeah. I've Crappy, seen him, seen yeah. Him live twice. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah. I'm, I use him as an example often and say, you know. Fender Stratocaster, well, listen to C60 yeah. on his crappy old second-hand guitar with half the strings missing. <laughs> Fantastic. What's your camera history then? Let's go through roughly your camera history. Where did you start? Obviously in the film days. Well, yeah. <coughs> I'm leaving that in. <laughs> I was giving you a pause to edit to. By all means do. Leave it in. Feel to <laughs> Man after my own heart. <laughs> Like Let's that. have it real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> camera history. Camera history. Got my first camera when I was about six. It was a 120 roll film twin lens. Don't know what it was. I think it was a Kodak of some sort. I don't know why I wanted a camera. I just said to my 120 friends. 120 like a cartridge? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was roll film. You know, 120 oh. roll film. Oh, okay. The whip, yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, I don't know why I wanted a camera. I just did. How old six, maybe seven. Oh, jeez. Um, and I played around with it a bit as a, as a kid, but you know, as a kid, most things, you know, you forget it after a little while. It's a new toy. Um, and I had nothing to do with cameras, probably until I was in my early 20s. My brother's girlfriend had brought him a Minolta outfit, and my brother started getting into it. And Steve's a very good photographer. He designs and builds beautiful gardens for people, right. really beautiful, lovely stuff. Um, He's a very good photographer. He said to me one day, walking down the street, 
past the London Camera Exchange and there was something in the window. You see, you've got to buy that. That's, that's great. It's a really good camera. Is it? Oh, I don't know. But that's how I got into it. So the next camera was a Minolta. I think it was an X700. Not sure. Film camera. What was your first professional camera? <laughs> the first professional camera, I don't know, what did I shoot on? Uh, you hear the clogs, by the way. Yeah, because I can't remember, because I don't know much about cameras, I can't remember what it was. I know it was a Nikon. This is great. It was um, F... No, it's, it's great that the passion is more about the photography. Yeah, I'm not interested in camera. technical side. It's yeah. brilliant to me. No, 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 I'm interested in photography. I couldn't give it's a like toss this. about cameras. <laughs> um, the mindless, useless pieces of junk. It's the person behind. Who is it? Is it Steiglitz, Edward Steiglitz? Somebody like that said the most important part of the camera is six inches behind it. Sorry, six, uh, six yeah. a little bit a behind little bit. it. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's all in there. Um, it was a Nikon... F something. Okay. It was a professional film camera. So, so Nikon, Nikon, Nikon? The only reason I got a Nikon was because, as with anyone who's starting out, you think, okay, what's a good camera? What's the best camera? Which is the best camera for, and all that stuff? And I was asking those questions too, and that's why I completely understand people asking the question. Sure. I'm not belittling the question. Um, but I asked that question, and I didn't seem to get a clear answer. One person said, oh, get a Canon this, and someone else said, get a Pentax, someone else said, get a... I said, oh, I don't know. A friend of mine, Caleb, um, he took some quite nice pictures. He had a Nikon. And that's it. I just thought, oh, okay, I'll just go and buy a Nikon. That was it. I thought, I've got to choose at some point. I can sit here going around in circles forever. And nobody seems to give me a clear, <laughs> definitive reason or answer. I bought a Nikon. I don't remember what it was. I've still got a Nikon F... I don't know what it is. <laughs> is it an f4 it's a 1970s press photographer's right. camera yeah right okay and i want to do a video about with it i want yeah. to dig out my old nikon yeah windy windy film camera and and do a video but what are we talking about <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> I got my Nikon. First professional I bought camera. the first professional camera. It was a Nikon something. Right, okay. Which uh, I'd, I'd had a couple of Nikons and I stuck with Nikon simply because I got some lenses that fit Nikons. Uh, I like the Nikon F mount system because everything fits. Um, and yeah, so when that you was my camera first camera. This is when all the thumb downers are getting ready. He better say the brand that I use. Yeah, I know. Give him a thumbs down because otherwise he's rubbish. Yeah. That's exactly oh, yeah, no. what. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, but I. I, I What's good about this is you're dithering through this because I'm making you feel uncomfortable because you really don't. You're not, want... I just haven't got a brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you clearly don't want to talk about the cameras. You want to talk about photography. And I'm interested. Love... Yeah, no, you're quite What do you right. shoot with that? And I'm not very good. I've got two cameras. I've got a Fuji X-T2 okay. mirrorless. Mirrorless, yeah. The thing which interested me with that, I had an X-T1, but I lost it. I left it on top of a bus and it drove off. Um, I've got an X-T2. What I loved about that system was purely the, the, the controls I use the most yep. are knobs and dials on the camera body. Okay. I haven't got to use a multifunction switch. I haven't got to go into a menu. Sure. My exposure compensation for if I'm in a semi-auto mode is on my thumb. I don't even have to, I can look through the viewfinder, I can just roll. Roll to the right, make it bright. Roll to the left, make it a bit darker. Yeah. Um, my aperture, it's a ring on the lens. So holding the camera, I can turn the aperture ring. My shutter speed, I can do it with... And it just fits with you. It just fits my hand. I like, I'm not saying it's the best camera in the world. It works for what I do. I like it because it's small. It's great for when I'm traveling, running workshops. Invariably, it's dangling on my wrist on a little wrist strap with the, with the bog standard 18 to 55 that comes with it. Rarely use anything else. The other camera I've got, it's quite old now. Uh, it's a Nikon D600. Okay. Um, that's a Nikon fanboys back on track again now, by the way. Nikon boys are back. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else, all you Canon and other That's brand Canon, users, yeah. you're fuming right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, welcome to the world of photography. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, oh, now I'm, now I'm in danger of going on a tangent. I'll come back. Uh, yeah, Nikon D600. Yeah. Uh, digital SLR. And it's only a case of the right tool for the job. I've got fast f2.8 lenses for the Nikon. Right. Occasionally I need them on professional shoots or something. The other thing is I find the autofocus on the Nikon with a long lens is more precise. Okay. 
Okay. I can be very precise. It will go in between little <clears throat> twiggy things. It's very fast and very precise. I find the autofocus on the Fuji with a long lens, it's kind of ponderous. It will miss things. It will hunt. It will get itself confused and stuck. Fuji users, you are now alienated, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> have you left me anybody <laughs> no let's upset everyone yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but that's the only reason it's the right tool for the job also I don't have any flash equipment for the Fuji because I tend to shoot available light particularly on workshops and travelling I prefer available light there are rare occasions doing a photo shoot when I might want to put a speed light on I need to help the available light um, and I just find the Nikon's great for that so you're up, you've been in the industry for a long time. You're very successful at what you do. What 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 motivates you? What still mo? Why bother? You've done it all, haven't you? You've been around the block. You've seen mm, it. No. Why bother? It, what motivates me? So it goes back to what I was saying initially. It's like I think we live in a beautiful world. The photography I love doing the most. The photography that moves, excites, and inspires me is telling a little bit about how people live on this world. Mm. So if I'm going to shoot a landscape out in some beautiful place, my ideal is I want a person in that. I want to see someone, whether it's in the Lake District. I'm, I'm not so interested just in you know the beautiful mountains and the scenery, but I would be more interested if there was a little crofter's cottage in the valley sure. and, and the guys running around or, or the woman running around with the dog and rounding up the sheep. You know, and, and then you've got the clouds and the mountains and the shaft of light and, and all that stuff. That's what motivates me. Very few people want to pay for that sort of photography. Commercial work, I'm very lucky. I'm privileged now to be in a position where I've got three criteria for, for accepting a commission. Will it be fun? Will it be interesting? Do I like the people? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. If the answer's no to any of those, then, then you know, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not the right photographer for you. Can I suggest someone? And then if I think they're real pain, I'll, I'll give them to a, someone I want to get back at them. Yeah. Uh, somebody I don't like. Yeah. Gary, but I, I've got a job for you. Yeah, Gary, I've got a job for you. <laughs> Gary, I've got another job for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah, and I'm very lucky to do that. What I love is the, it, 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 something, it, it came out of a trip to um, Romania many years ago when I got involved with homeless people and, and mm. stuff like that. And it just really excited me. It was the most fulfilling and rewarding experience to think, I might have made a little difference. It's like Luke with his light bulb on the bridge in Zurich and things. That's what really excites me. Um, so often the commissions I, I, I do, people are surprised by. Um, so lots of people have probably seen a picture of a, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner that I shot for jet aviation out in Switzerland. They yeah. build luxury private jets. They're wonderful. They totally fulfill that. They're interesting, they're fun, and I like them. They might be a multinational corporation, but they are a really great crowd. They listen, they're understanding, they're helpful, they're fun. Mm. Great. Oh, who wouldn't want to work with guys like that? Um, through to one of my regulars, who I do a shoot for every couple of years, they're called, um, I think it's Exelon Autonomy. They run um, autonomous living. Okay. They, they, they manage autonomous living for people who have... I don't know what the politically correct term is, mental difficulties, I don't know. Sure. sure. Um, you know, and they do a stunning job. They're a really great company. The boss is a lovely guy, and the whole thing filters through his company. They're not a huge, huge corporation. But everything they do, they really care. They really care about giving people a service, autonomous living. And I love doing jobs for them, photographing in their facilities, the staff, the people, you know, the, I'd love to be able to show some pictures. I, I probably can't because there, there are client confidentiality things and they, they use sure. some on their website. If you look up, I think it's Exelon Autonomy. They might just be called Autonomy Care. Google it. Um, have a look at their website. I shot that lot at the moment. Um, and I just love doing it. It's so fulfilling and rewarding and exciting, and I do it a bit on the cheap for them, just because I love working with do, them. Do you know, you're answering the questions now in such a different way, because we're talking about photography. Yeah, that's true. That yeah. when you're on the edge of your seat talking about boring things like cameras, uh, it's... Yawn. I can, I can feel yeah. it. It's fantastic. <laughs> right, Mike, influences. Um, two questions, really. One, who are your influences? And two... Somebody's mentioned this to me before, which I find really strange, but I want to get your take on it. Can you be a good photographer if you don't have any influences? In good other words, one. 
If you just jump straight in, buy a new camera, go out and do your own thing, can you really be a good photographer if you don't study somebody else's work? Hey, good questions. Influences, you mean as in my influence, who influenced me? Your influence. Okay. Begin. We're going to start with that. Yeah. One. Okay, Sebastian Salgado. If, I, lo I love that guy's stuff. Uh, his book, Workers, uh, I used to get it out of the library, you know, because, you know, we're going back pre-internet. Um, great big book, huge tome of a book. I used to order at the local library and just stare at it. It's just breathtaking. I had the privilege to be running my um, masterclass in Zurich last year uh, when Salgado's Exodus exhibition was on in Zurich. And I said to the guys on the workshop, look, you know, this isn't part of the curriculum, but it is an opportunity. Show of hands, who'd like to go and see it? Because it's here. And they all actually said, yeah, we'd love to. It, it just blew me away. <laughs> Salgado. Okay. Um, I loved uh, Dorothea Lange, you know, some of the stuff from, you know, the sharecroppers and all this sort of stuff shot in the depression of the 1930s. And the assignment was what is really there? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What actually is the human condition? W. Eugene Smith, war photographer. I think he did some amazing stuff. More contemporary, you've got Steve McCurry. I think a lot of his stuff is Really, really breathtaking. Um, mm, there, there are many. There are many. Don McCullen, obviously. Uh, somebody said they're going to introduce me to Don McCullen. happens because uh, I just missed him at uh, an event I was teaching and speaking at and I thought he was going to be a speaker. I thought, oh, I'm going to meet Don McCullen. I didn't. I met um, others instead. Right. Um, yeah, so those are the influences, some of my main influences. And of course, influence is it's an ongoing thing. I'm going to talk about it. So I was invited to speak and teach at the International Photography Festival. It's called Exposure. It's in the United Arab Emirates. I didn't really know what I was going to. Um, I thought, wow, that's really cool. They're going to pay me to go to Dubai and speak at something. Wow. And I looked at the website and thought, yeah, it looks pretty cool. What I didn't understand is I was going to be spending time with some of the world's elite. I mean, wow. Um, it was absolutely, that's where I met Estra Suarez. And, and there were many other National Geographic photographers, internationally renowned photojournalists. Um, I'll put a it, link to that video, by the way, in the description. I am super excited to have been invited to speak and teach here at the International Photography Festival in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. This is the Hall of Fame of photographers from around the world, world-class guys who are exhibiting and sharing their knowledge at this astonishing event. And I particularly would like you to meet this guy, Estra Suarez. Because I've seen yeah. the video and it's a very good video. Yeah, he's a very inspiring guy. As everybody there was, I'm having Sunday lunch with one of the guys this, this coming Sunday, but they were gathered from all over the world. It's a cross-cultural exchange of ideas, of telling stories through pictures and imagining what a world would be like without photography. It's not a trade show, mm. unlike the one we have in the UK in Birmingham. Sure. Um, breathtaking, inspiring thing. A uh, lady called Amy Vitali. She recently had the cover of National Geographic. She does a huge amount of great work, you know, to do with elephants and wildlife and, and out in Africa. Really inspiring. Um, Will Barrod Lucas, another one who's done a huge amount of work with wildlife and, you know, wow. elephant conservation. Uh, yeah. A stunning, stunning things. These guys are influences, current influences. 
and others. Sorry if you're listening and I missed you out. All you guys that were there took my breath away. Um, who are you again? <laughs> <laughs> you're a good man. Um, so let's go on to... Go back. Can you be a good photographer yep. without an influencer? Yeah, I don't see why not. We all have to find our own way. We all have to find our own style. We are all our own people. Um, and I, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've never really deeply studied the work of any of the people I've talked about. I've been more interested in who they are rather than just their photos because it's easy for us to start to compare. Are they better? Am I as good as? You know, wish my stuff was like theirs. We all have our own way. Sure. Um, well, then we'll then and I think it's not Instagram, a good idea, we? pardon? Then we're just Instagram. We're we? just Instagram, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah, are, are we posting pictures because our ego needs a little massage, you know? Or, and funny enough, I wrote this on an Instagram post recently. Uh, I put up a picture, one that I really loved. We did a video at Solstice at Stonehenge just before Christmas, the winter solstice, and I loved that experience. I loved it, it was fabulous. But you know, I put up my favorite picture from the shoot. And, you know, my PA Emma, she said, she, she said, oh, well, that one, really? What about the one with the sun coming through the stones and all the sky? Oh, yeah, well, I just was much more interested in this guy playing the drums. And I got this shot, it took ages to get it. I'm looking over his shoulder yeah. uh, at the sunrise. And there's a girl, her name's Amy, Amy, Amy Kingsmill. She's a performance artist and, and artist, etc. You know, she had all the stuff on. She had a deer skull on her head and she's moving and dancing in the stones. I was much more interested in that than sure. the sunrise. The sunrise was beautiful, don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking it. It's just what excites me and I don't know why I've gone off down that path. But every time we take a picture, it's a timepiece and more often than not, it's the backstory that's attached to it. So like you say, on Instagram, people might not like it, but it might be one of your favorite pictures of all time. That's what we were talking about. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I post it on Instagram and I just you said- you there? No. <laughs> Maybe you should have. <laughs> might be Guinness. Yeah. Um, I don't even drink, Bilali. Um, yeah, but I, I put on that post, you know, this is one of my favorite pictures and I just ask people to comment because I notice when I post one of my favorites, it gets the fewest likes it's the fewest responses. Are you still learning? Yeah, absolutely. No question, we're all still learning. And I think the minute we think there's nothing more to learn, it's time we stop. There's always more to learn. I'm gonna be running a workshop with Esther Suarez, National Geographic photographer out in Ecuador. Now, he's a photojournalist. He has skills that I can't even come close to or imagine. It's all very well waiting for the decisive moment, waiting for the light. Yeah, that all plays a part, but, Photojournalists have to go into situations they haven't got the luxury of waiting for the perfect light and all the rest of it. They've got to go in there, they maybe have anything from 60 seconds to a few minutes to get the shot. Sure. You know? Um, and you're under pressure because you'd be working for a client. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Got to deliver the business. Yeah. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to working with Esther. So I went on a workshop photo walk with him at the exposure, he, he was teaching and running focus groups and stuff and running some, some workshops. So I managed to gate crash one of his for an hour or so, uh, street photography workshop in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. And yeah, absolutely wonderful, just listening to someone who is a master of something that I'm not. I love street photography, he's a master. We can wow. always learn from someone else. And we learn from each other. I notice on workshops and stuff, we do feedback sessions pretty much every day whenever we can. You know, peer-to-peer -peer stuff, tell everyone to choose their sure. top five pictures and, and we all have a little look. And it's amazing, it's fascinating to look at what these desperate, this group of people, they all got the same ingredients, they're photographing the same place, what they come up with, because it's always different. And, you know, I learn off my students as well. It's a two-way street. Sure. Love it. Favourite place to photograph? I haven't got one, really. Uh, Favourite place so far? Uh, Myanmar. Uh, used to be called Burma. All right, okay. Myanmar. Uh, we ran a workshop out there a few years ago. We've got another one running, coming up. Um, I would say of, if you like, a collection of pictures. You know, you go somewhere, you come home with a collection of pictures. 
That is my favourite collection of pictures I have ever shot, um, c collectively. Um, I just thought it was an amazing place. I thought the people were astonishingly lovely. Maybe it's because it's been a closed country, they haven't had much tourism for a long time, although that is now, of course, on the increase. Um, it's kind of like the cultural identity is still intact, rather than like the rest of the world who are all trying to be Americans for some unknown reason. Sure. It's like, uh, but no, they're just like, you know, quietly curious. Why are you here? Oh, you know, and lots of little voices saying hello as you walk around. And But it was a breathtakingly beautiful place. It was totally beautiful. And I know I've come back with some of my favourite pictures from, from being in Burma. And I'm really looking forward to running the one out there later this year. If somebody came on your workshop, what's the number one message that you want them to go home with? What's I think the number one message I want them to go home with is that the world isn't quite such a scary place as many imagine. That there, it's a beautiful place and beauty can be found everywhere. And I think thinking and seeing like a photographer helps us do that. And that's really what the workshops are about. It's about being somewhere that's exciting and interesting and inspiring. Because if we're not excited, interested and inspired, how can we take exciting, interesting, inspiring pictures? Sure. Uh, we can't. Um, and yeah, so I think the main thing I want them to go home with is is a new sense of the world, a, a nice nice batch, a nice collection of pictures that they can look at and say, wow, I did that, and feel good about it, and want to tell people the backstories behind Story those tell. pictures, you know? You know, because, mm. and hopefully they'll have a great backstory. Because, you know, we've all sat in someone's front room and they've gone, here's me in front of the palm tree and, and here's, here, here, here's Angie in front of the palm tree. <laughs> we've got a passerby to take a picture of both of us in front of them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I want them to come home with something where they've got an engaging, interesting picture and an engaging, interesting backstory as well as some new skills and new confidence. A bit more confidence. It's about confidence as well come home feeling confident in themselves as people and as photographers. Perfect. Love that answer. Right. I've got a technical question, but I'm not even going to bother asking it. I'm going to skip that one. Go on, ask it. I want to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just wanted to ask so people had an understanding of what your workflow is. Do you shoot in RAW? Or is that a silly question? I apologise if it is. You shoot in RAW. I hear you mention JPEG, JPEG, JPEG all the time on your, um, on your podcasts. Or obviously on your YouTube channel. Do I? Yeah, but I, I, I'm not saying I've heard you say that you take pictures in okay. JPEG. I yeah. just want to be clear with that. Yeah. So you shoot in RAW, what roughly... Generally speaking, I shoot in RAW purely because RAW is not a way to fix something. Post-production isn't like where we mend something that's broken. It's where we bring to life our vision for an image. Okay. The camera, when it shoots JPEG, has no idea of what a scene actually look like, looks like. It's got an algorithm programmed into it by its extremely clever creators, which takes an average guess and it, and it, and it does things, but it doesn't know. Post-production is like our darkroom. Ansel Adams, all the people I mentioned that inspire me, they all hand printed their stuff and, and some still do. Don McCullen still prints in his own darkroom. Um, it's, it's just the equivalent of making a handprint. It's where we bring something to life. We've still got to have those skills. We've still got to get the exposure bang on. We've got to get it absolutely right in camera. And then when we've got a great original RAW file, we can whop it through our post-production and just kind of bring it to life. Do I do a lot of post-production? I do as little as possible I can get away with because I've got lots of other things I want to do. Some need more work than others. Um, I don't use presets. Lots of people have asked me about presets. I don't use presets because, to be honest with you, I find it takes me as long, if not longer, to wade through clicking on presets, going, how about that, how about that, how about that? Oh, I don't know, I kind of like that one, I don't know, well, what about that one, what about that one? And I think by the time I've clicked on a dozen presets to see which one I like, I could have just done it. Yeah. And every image is individual. Every image tells a different story, you know. How, a how preset do I want it? isn't a magic solution. A preset is just like letting the camera shoot JPEG and put its own interpretation on, yeah. on the photographer's work. Agreed. And I'm not saying they're not a shortcut. Yeah, if you're doing studio work, You've got consistency throughout your shot. You might want to create a preset and then you can apply it as you import into Lightroom or something. And you've done nearly all your post-production for you as the images were imported. Okay. 
Lightroom, Photoshop, Capture One. I use Lightroom because I learned how to use it and I can't be asked. I don't like tech. I'm not good. <laughs> I don't want to learn another one. <laughs> Rarely right. use Photoshop these days. It's more the domain of graphic designers, I think. Right. Let's, um, let's lighten it ever so slightly. Right. Okay. Um, I'm paying you to take a month off. Mm. I'm fed up of having you around the house. Okay, I'm paying you. We haven't lived together long. We're still no. getting used to each other. <laughs> Just get out of my hair. Go where? Shoot what? Anywhere. You've got, I... you got a month. Mm. And money's no object. South America That's right now. by the way, because I'm not rich. And we don't, we don't live together. <laughs> <laughs> I have asked, but I keep saying no. Tell me like that, honey. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, South America. Okay. Uh, because I haven't been there. Anywhere I haven't been, basically. So you've got a um, month? I've got a month. Anywhere I haven't been. A month isn't long enough to go anywhere I haven't been. So I, I, if it's a month, I would only go to one place. I'd rather go to one place and understand it okay, than, than, than have a list and going... It drives me mad when people say, I've done Canada, I've done New York, I've, I've done America, I've done Australia, I've Iceland. done New Zealand, <laughs> I've done Iceland. No, you haven't. <laughs> no, you haven't. You couldn't, you couldn't do, in inverted commas, a country in a lifetime. Because there's so much to see. I'd rather Absolutely. go somewhere and spend the time. South America, where would I go in South America? I can't tell you for sure, but I, would, I, want, to see, I want to meet tribes people in, in the jungles. I'd love to see Mayan and Inca temples and, and some of that history, the jungle. Um, what would I like to photograph? All that stuff. How the people live there, how they interact with it. I'd love to spend some time you know, with some tribes. And also with... with, with aid projects. This is really important to me. Since doing the thing I did out in Romania, it completely changed the way I view things. I think it's, poverty tourism is really bad news. We've got to give something back. Everything has to be a fair exchange, a fair trade. If these people are giving of themselves so generously so we can get amazing pictures, we need to put something back. And it could be something simple. The Burma workshop, Myanmar workshop we ran a few years ago, it was something as simple as buying a bunch of solar panels, batteries and lights for a village. That's it. Because the kids in the villages, they don't go to school because during the day they're looking after goats and chickens and doing what they have to do wow. to survive. And then it's dark and mm -hmm. there is no electricity. A couple of solar panels, batteries and lights, somebody puts that up on a house, they've got some light, the kids want to learn to read and to write and have a little bit more of an understanding of the world. And then they can make a more educated choice as to whether they want to leave the village and go and live in the city. Because when they go thinking the city is the answer to everything and they end up in the slums, and they end up on the outskirts, and their life just gets destroyed. And just something as simple as a few solar panels and a light can transform someone's life. And yeah, so, so those are the things wow. that... That's yeah, so homes, villages, things like that. All the things that. you could have said then. You could have just said the Rocky Mountains and just take brilliant pictures. Yeah, no. No, I'm not really a hardcore landscape. I like landscapes. I'm not someone who's going to go, I like a landscape, but I'm too lazy. Landscapers are patient. They're hardcore. They climb the mountain five times, waiting for the light to be right. They sit there all the time, looking at it, eating a sandwich with a thermos flask, waiting, you know, <laughs> for the right moment, for the light to be right. And then it doesn't happen. They go down, they go back up the next day. Yeah. It's not me. I... I I'm too impatient. I like, I like a bit of life, something busy. It's why I like Asia. It's why I like countries like that. It's happening all around. And, of course, in the UK, we, could, we have got it here, of course. But we've got this ridiculous paranoia about why are you taking my picture? What are you going to do with it? You know? Sure. And, oh, security guard in London. I was doing a one-on-one -on -one day with a guy from oh. Portugal. He met me in London. And we were walking around taking some pictures. There were these guys on the side of the building. I thought, oh, that's really cool. Look at these guys dangling off the... Excuse me, you can't photograph our building, you know. I said, yes, I can. I've just done it. <laughs> oh, you're not allowed to. I said, oh, really? I'll take a picture of you then. There's Don't you do that? There's I said. all sorts of silly bylaws in, in, in London and various places. In most Manchester, of it's... We've been clobbered as well. Yeah, most of it's guff. I mean, there are laws coming in, privacy laws. Privacy, what right have we got to privacy? Goodness sake, if you're in public, you have no right to privacy, period, full stop. Why be paranoid about having your pitch taken? What is it with our culture? Why are we so scared of everything and each other? Why is it you can go to Asia, all these other places, and no one takes a blind eye? You could walk up to a stranger in Cambodia and you could probably just go like this, click, 
Yeah. And they'd probably ignore you, and if they didn't want you to do it, they might go, no, no, stop it. This is us keeping it light, by the way. Yeah, sorry, I'm not very it's light. Not I'm, like quite, I'm, I'm quite deep. I fall around a lot. Of yours, for heaven's sake. I can't help it. I am now <laughs> a one-man cause. He's up there now, he's up there. Right, back in time or forward in time, give me your dream job. Got it. I've got it. Oh, you've got it now. I've got right. it. Oh, no, I've got it. I've got it. Right, what's the answer there? I've got it. Oh. Yeah, I've got it. I'm doing it. Perfect. Luckiest man in the world. Top answer. Bucket list. You didn't expect a short no. one, did you? Through me now. Bucket list. Oh, that's Do you so have a bucket long. List? Yes, my bucket list. The main thing on my bucket list is I need another 200 years of life without aging or deteriorating any further because right. there's so many things I want to do. I need a minimum of 200 more years to do them all. Uh, yeah, I want to... Yeah, you're, you're in danger with that one. It's, um, yeah, I want to do more. I'm, uh, the whole purpose of the business, yeah, I want to generate money. It's a business. Of course I want to generate money. Is there anything I want? No, there's nothing in the world I want. I've got anything I want. I've got it. I don't need boats and fast cars. It bores the teeth out of me. But I would love to have financial freedom. So I've got to think, oh, I can't afford to do that. Because what I do want to do is more of what we just talked about. Wouldn't it be great if we could take groups of photographers to come out to see some amazing things that, and, and maybe put a bit of good back into the world, raise some money. You know, people come on a workshop. We already do it. A percentage of any money from a workshop does go to something to make a bit of a difference. But wouldn't it be great if we didn't need to do that? Wouldn't it be great if instead of people, you know, me having to take I don't know, 50% or whatever it is of the money from a workshop to go into my income, didn't need that. Great, come on, let's go out to Cambodia. Let's go to South America. Let's go to somewhere. Let's get some really cool shots, having an awesome experience. And then all the money that's generated can go into something that makes a little bit of a difference sure. out there. Because, you know, that, that's my goal. That's my bucket list, <laughs> number one. I want to be financially free so I can go and do that. Well, it's a similar question, but it's going to be my last question, apart from my quick-fire questions, just for a bit of fun, a bit of humour. Mm. Um, it's probably similar. It's basically if you won the lottery, what would you do tomorrow? Would you stop work? No. It's almost like when you retire, would you stop taking pictures? I can't imagine retiring. Would you stop being a photographer when you, you know? It's, no, it's like it's strange, isn't it? It's what I do. Um, I just do what I just said. My bucket list. It would be like won the lottery, whatever the the system may be. I would then reinvest that money into trying to take people to see more of the world, to help people understand it's not so scary. There are some amazing things and incredible experiences. It's a lady called Gina. She came over from America to do a couple of one-on-one -on -one days with me. I'm, I'm totally blown away by this. I think it was two or three people last year flew across the Atlantic Ocean to spend the day with me doing photography training, and that gets me. Yeah. How committed are they? And I'm moved touched that they have that trust in me. Gina, she left her home in uh, you know one of the southern states in America. Sure. She's never left her home state before. She sent me several messages and said, I am so scared. I'm so worried I'm going to come to England and you're all into lecture and you'll think I'm this stupid idiot backward country hick from, from America, you know, from the deep <laughs> south. And she stepped over that fear and she got on a plane and she came over here and spent some time and invested in herself and her photography. And yes, she learnt photography stuff, but more than that, she's gone home and she's now got involved in stuff, you know, helping kids in a local deprived area get some land for a skate park. And she's been photographing all that. And it's like, that's what turns me on. Is that the answer to your question? Or did I go off on one of my own self-invented tangents? <laughs> well, it was win the lottery. I'm not... That's what I'd like to do. Be able to do Give things. Give money back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it would. It would be great. Yeah, if I had, as I said, if I had no need for money, because that's taken care of, I would be doing more workshops, getting involved with communities, and probably working more closely with aid organisations to, to show people that the world is a pretty amazing place. Awesome. And yeah. try and do a bit of good. Because when you do a bit of good in the world, it comes back. You know, Can't it does. Work. It does. It I'm absolutely believing it. You, um, you smile at a stranger. The stranger smiles at you. You just feel good, don't you? It's just a little, little tiny lift in yeah, the day, good, you know? And when you do something for someone else, it's not about being all anti-righteous. If you do it from a good place because you want their day to be a bit better, it comes back ten times over. I absolutely believe that. And that's what I learned in Romania. Cool. Right, Mike, thank you very much indeed. 
Now, I've got some quick fire questions I want to throw at you. Okay? Now, I need you to answer the questions that's on here, but you're Mike Brown, so you can say what you want. I'm Mike Waffle. I'm going to not waffle. I'm going to be. Well, quick fire questions. Quick fire! Require a quick fire answer. Yeah. Okay, but you're Not Mike my Brown. usual half an hour. But I've done something a little bit different because I've studied you. Right? Um, I've written also down the answers I believe that you're going to say. So I'm just going to see how close. I am. Maybe I should do this twice. Kiss it. If I get it wrong, <laughs> I can just ignore that part. Right, are you ready for this then? Okay, okay, let's lighten ever so slightly. Right, question. Black and white or colour? Could be either, depends on the picture, generally colour. I think I could probably stop there. <laughs> that was a quick one. Is that question quick? one. I can't no, give you I've got, one. I've got it wrong. I could probably just stop there. Maybe okay, do you, want, well, do you want to just start that bit? No, again? no, no. Okay. No, not at all. Film or digital? Digital. <laughs> Flash or natural? Natural whenever possible. Rich or popular? Oh. Mm. Neither. Neither. I don't see wealth or popularity. Fulfillment. <laughs> Landscape or street? Street. Interviewer or interviewee? Interviewer, because you get to learn something new. Lightroom or Photoshop? Lightroom. Vista or Intimate? Do you mean uh, Vista as in? The wide shot. Oh, I see. Storytelling or the intimate detail. Whatever the photo demands. Whether it's a wide or whether it's... You're just being Mike Brown now, aren't you? Yeah, because I can't answer that. One photo will need a wide vista shot to tell the story of it. Another needs to be in tight. Uh, there isn't an answer. It's whatever the photo demands. Rock star or film star? Neither. <laughs> I don't want to be either. <laughs> don't make me cut this out. Don't no, no, no. But out. it's true. It's true. I have no interest in being either. I thought you'd have said rock star because of the motorbike and the goatee beard. No, no. I'm yeah. the same with motorbikes as I am with cameras. I know bugger all about what's on the market. I all my mates talk about motorbikes and I don't know what they're talking about. I just like riding my bikes. One of my bikes, I've had it for a while and I've done 115,000 miles on that one bike. I've got five. <laughs> I run a motorbike. It's, it's lovely. It's where I go to meditate and chill out. I saw mine a few years ago. I had a VFR 800. I had to mm. sell it because I couldn't grow a goatee. So I thought, it's got to go. I understand the it problem. Didn't sit right. I understand. Okay, one last question then. For us oldies out there. Okay, and I need an answer. Don't pretend that you didn't watch any of these. Tis was or swap shop? <laughs> oh, don't make me. Don't make I did. Me this out. I, thought I this did. Was a good part. I did. I did. I did. I was a really boring child. I thought both of them would drivel. <laughs> <laughs> but Sally James was in Tiz Was. E. I'll cut this out then. I don't know who that is. No, but it's accurate. It's no. You don't have to cut it out. Right. I, I have. Yeah. I. I don't remember. I was more your Blue Peter because I kind of, kind of liked. <laughs> oh no! Oh, that's it's quite all interesting. The appeals. That's what it was, isn't it? People sending in money every week with the appeal. No, the appeal I was always. It was. It's like I love the way they were making stuff out of nothing and 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 <laughs> creating things. And yeah, no, I was a bit of an odd job. Well, I'm glad we didn't have a bet on it because all my answers there are pretty much wrong. Ah. So, uh, well, Mike, thank you very much, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honour to meet you. And very genuine answers. I felt that they came from the heart. Thank you very Apart much. Apart from the bit where we were talking about your cameras. But I'm still leaving <laughs> That it came there. from the heart. I was just in their arse. <laughs> Cheers, Mark. Thank you for coming all this way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.